We're going to start in a, a, give us a couple minutes. They're, they're waiting, they're doing another recording, so we need to wait until that's done. Okay. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Um, I see we do have uh, Stephen online, so thank you for being here. Thank you all for being here. Um, just want to welcome you to Coalition Bargaining, our first session for plan year 2025. Uh, my name is Tim Kubrick. I'm Chief of Human Resources. I'll make sure that everybody knows who, who we are. So, if Justin, if you could start, that would be helpful. And we'll work our way around the table. Thank you, Justin Katz, uh, CTA Executive Director. Gordon CTA President. You're Heather on. Frederick, Chief Financial Officer. Nancy Bolton, Director, Risk and Benefits Management. Leanne Lenano, Risk and Benefit, or Risk Benefit Manager, sorry. <laughs> Jermaine English, Manager, Labor Relations. Jean Marie Middleton, Assistant General Counsel. V. Danielle Williams, Senior Attorney, Office of General Counsel. Carol Session, PBA. I think, uh, Stephen, if you're talking, you're on mute, I think. Yeah. I don't think he's talking Okay. Oh. Katie, just in time to introduce yourself. <laughs> We're working through introductions here, so if you want to. Officer Laporte, PBA. And online, we do have Stephen Voss uh, from ASOP. So, uh, again, thank you all for being here today. We wanted to get started with, with these sessions um, and, and work through an update on the plan's performance since the last time we met. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nancy Bolton, our Director of Risk and Benefits Management. Thank you, Tim, and good morning, everyone. This is a brief presentation. Uh, that we'll just work through this morning to update you. The flow of the presentation is just a summary of our past discussions over the past couple of years, a plan year 2023 performance recap, and you'll recall that our health plan uh, runs on a calendar year basis. So we'll be speaking fiscal year and calendar year, but when I say plan year, I'm referring to January through December. Plan year 2024 and 2025 rate projections, uh, rate change options to cover projected, we just put it right out there, $59 million funding deficit, which is projected in 2025, um, and just red line changes to coalition bargaining articles and then discussion. So, um, doesn't really fit the screen, but you can see there. Just a kind of a recap on our conversations over the past couple of years. Uh, in April of 2022, we shared this kind of unfriendly slide with you for the first time, uh, indicating concern for the projected increases um, in healthcare claims. And these were increases projected by our plan actuary, who looks at our experience every year and, and forecasts the uh, projected performance of the plan for the coming years. 
So the escalating claims forecast was inconsistent, as we all know, with the previous trend for the district. We typically have beaten the trend, and as you know, we went for almost a decade or maybe a little more without premium increases because our funding was sufficient to support our claims. So the suspicion was that COVID was the driving force for the <coughs> 21 and 22 increases. And so the COVID-related portions of those increases were offset uh, by ESSER funds. In May of 2022, we began providing you all with um, monthly medical and prescription claims data, just the claims incurred, um, net of administrative costs or any of those things, but just the claims data so that we could collaboratively monitor uh, how the claims were looking month over month. And we also worked collaboratively to consider some cost-saving initiatives under the plan. You'll remember the medical necessity program, surgical management solutions, and digital physical therapy uh, that we talked about. We did not impose any premium increases for plan year 2023. So when we regrouped in April of 2023, our COVID claims did decline, um, but unfortunately, overall claims costs continued to escalate. They were driven by things like medical inflation and new specialty prescription drugs, and um, every employer in the country is having the same conversation about the costs rising under their health plans. On April 11th of 2023, uh, we shared the projected losses for plan years 2023 and 2024, and we did um, provide premium increase options to support the escalating costs. A sufficient increase, um, we recommended 30 million, but we were not successfully able to come to that total with our negotiations. Uh, we did cumulatively negotiate an increase that totaled just under 10 million, and so we collaboratively achieved that, which was a good thing, but it, unfortunately, the losses um, were not covered sufficiently and they're expected to grow larger. The actuary actually predicted a $29.2 million loss in plan year 2023 and the actual loss to the plan was 29.8. <clears throat> so you're used to seeing this and each year the font gets smaller as we add additional years. But the takeaway from this, and we will send you this um, Claims as of February later this afternoon. I, said, I, already, oh, I sent already. it to you all this morning. Okay. Not too long ago, so you might not have seen it. But the bottom line is to just show um, how our average monthly claims, even when we factor in higher prescription drug rebates, the average monthly claims are still growing, um, unfortunately, month over month. February was a bit better than January. So, you know, but two months into the year is, is just not enough data to, to make a trend or to give us any information that would indicate that our actuary is too conservative. But uh, you, you can study that more when it comes to you later or we'll answer questions later. So at plan year 2023 end, uh, we had a reserve of 88 days of claims. Uh, Florida statute requires a 60-day um, surplus fund for self-insured plans in the state of Florida. So plan years 24 and 25 are currently projected to experience losses as indicated, which will result in an ending reserve of just 24 days and then going into negative territory, respectively, for plan years 24 and 25. Um, it just in graphing this, the data illustrates how, you know, not just Palm Beach County schools, but any self-insured plans, um, a typical five to ten percent trend increase can can get very bad very quickly if funding doesn't increase. Um, the district used the ESSER funds to carry the plan for those COVID losses, um, but. Those funds are no longer available as COVID claims are no longer driving the cost increases. So now the deficit has grown and the funding need for plan year 2025 is projected at 59 million. 
uh, just for us to break even, which wouldn't address the projected shortfall in the 60-day safe harbor surplus, as I referenced, is required by Florida statute. The blue line represents that shortfall, which is projected to be more than 40 million uh, if no funding uh, is changed. Estimates for plan years 24 and 25 show the projected cumulative effect on the uh, plan losses at the current level of funding, which is the yellow line. So in order to break even for plan year 2025, the plan actuary estimates the funding must be increased at a minimum as illustrated below. <laughs> Last year, we indicated a need for 30 million following our historical trend, which has been more favorable. Um, so the 30 million that we projected was actually uh, a little bit less than the actuary's projections of 40 million. Uh, and then we projected potentially another 10 million in 25. However, we were only able to negotiate the 9.5, leaving the $20 million shortfall. Um, and with the actuary's projections for plan year 2023 proving to be substantially correct, the plan with current funding is predicted to face um, a snowballing deficit and required funding increase just to break even at nearly 60 million for plan year 2025. So I don't have to repeat that, <laughs> unfortunately. I know I'm, I'm giving you bad news this morning, but. The funding, pre the premium increase based on the current enrollment, which is just under 20,000 employees, uh, this is not a proposal. This is just breaking down what the funding costs will need to be with 248 uh, million per, per month per employee. I'm sorry. <laughs> the news isn't that bad, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, $248 per employee per month, which is $124 per paycheck for the 24 pay period folks. So that's the funding that collectively we would need to um, raise to cover just the cost of the plan to break even, and it does not restore the uh, state required reserve. So just to share a little bit, we've updated our school district comparison. Um, just to share again, our current rates are in the far right over there, and you can see that we're still very competitive, even with our current level of funding, and that the district has historically generously subsidized um, dependent coverage on, at a much higher rate than our competing school districts. Um, so just, this is just a snapshot to show you where we are, and other school districts are facing these funding deficits as well as illustrated by the rates that they're charging employees for dependent coverage. And then, of course, just our coalition bargaining um, articles. We aren't proposing any benefit changes at this time. We're looking at the plan. Uh, currently, we're marketing um, the prescription drug um, contracts through United with our health consultant. Uh, we're looking at just various ways to ensure that the plan is as competitive as possible. We're not currently proposing any copay changes because the deficit is significant and there, there, there just wouldn't be anything that would cumulatively make that kind of an impact. So we're looking at, you know, centers of excellence and, and our network and our um, our diabetes plan, um, United has beefed up their diabetes plan offering. We don't like the pricing now, but we're having conversations. So we are looking at things that contain costs, um, but we're not proposing any changes to the article other than updating the, uh, the dates and the contributions. And um, so this, this concludes my brief presentation. So with that, we'll open it up to any discussion or questions. Could you go back to that, the first slide? Sure. There might have been the second, but. Right there. Yes. Um, what's the explanation for the decrease in income from 22 to 23? Revenue? Of, of 13, yeah, at, the, at total income at the top. 
it's showing that there's 13 million less in, in dollars. Yeah, we did actually have a, a significant decrease in enrolled employees during that period after COVID. So we are, we are, we turnover, I'm mm -hmm. assu assuming, right? We had, we lost employees. Gotcha. Um, so that means if we, pandemic. if we manage to reduce our, our vacancy rates across the board, that'll lead to higher revenues, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. Potentially. Well, it was actual plan participation went down. So actually enrollment. Yeah, in, enrollment. In, in yeah. The plan okay. went down. So it was less in premiums. And then there was also less, I believe, that we were able to put in. So for plan year 23, we didn't contribute anything for ESSER from, because we, there weren't any COVID-related claims that were eligible. Correct. So is the... For 22, is the 20 million from ESSER included in that 206 million? No, that's not. It's in addition. Okay. But I do believe the difference from 22 to 23 was related to enrollment. Okay. And then subsequent question, the, the lack of a change in the revenue from 23 to 24, despite the increases last year, where did, were the increases in the revenue derived from what we negotiated the district and employees were put in zeroed out by lower employee enrollment numbers? No, that was what was predicted with no increase. So if you see that last plan year 24 does not include the nine and a half million. Okay, so that just needs to be adjusted to reflect right. the settlement from right. last year. Right, right. That's not okay. reflected here, but it's reflected in the actual um, charts. Yeah, gotcha. that was just a snapshot of what we shared <coughs> this time last year before we had the chance to negotiate. The next ones, does it show it? Mm -hmm. But then that would Looks that would better inform the projected gains and losses because that forty one point eight million for twenty four is based on the the non increased revenue. Well, if you move forward to slide, move forward to so the um, the projected increase is included in slide six. Is that slide six? Yes. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay. So yeah. in twenty twenty four. That includes the 9.5 million. So even including the 9.5 million, the actuary's uh, still projecting we're going to have a $40 million loss. So is, is it safe to assume that based on the actuarial projections, the district anticipates a need for $30 million in additional revenue every year at this rate? No. I mean, so the, the reason why is because we didn't put in the 30 million. So there's he's seeing an increase from 24 to 25. The additional need is 20 million. So it will it will range each year based on whether we continue to trend uh, and be consistent with the national trends, which is showing 10 percent increases. Uh, we historically were at. 2% increases at our district, but now we are trending with national trends of 6 to, you know, 10%. And so that was one of the reasons why we were looking at what other options we could do. Uh, we've been growing our diabetes program. Mm -hmm. We went through um, some uh, potential program changes uh, last year, but those changes and uh, plan design changes are not going to get to a $60 million savings. I mean, at, at most, you're looking at a million or two million. I, I know Ms. Bolton is looking at other options. Um, if you'd like to speak with some of those options, and there's no guarantee that the savings would be incurred, but she has been reaching out to our providers to see what what are they able to come back to us with as, as potential plan, plan design changes or, or changes in how we operate and do business that will result in additional uh, savings within, within our health plan. But just like I said, it's not going to ever get us to the $60 million. It would only help to, to offset what that increase is. What's the total number of employee participation in the health plan? It's the 19864 mm -hmm. right now. And that fluctuates slightly, but that's current enrollment. And we were over 20,000. We were in 2021, I believe, before the pandemic, or maybe 2020. But we went down um, by about 1,000 employees at one point. Now we're back up. Um, Is there a way for us to get kind of a historical chart for as many fiscal years or, or calendar years as you have here of the employee enrollment rate? Yes, we sure. have that. Okay. Yes, we have that. 
because that helps to also drive which there there is another um, metric we look at is claim per employee you know so that be, to be able to show you that you know even though it, you know it looks like the the premiums are going the premiums are going down because we have less <coughs> enrollment but the claims per employee are going up on the uh, on the claims report that we get um, monthly now mm -hmm. is it possible to add to the claims report a revenue report since since the fund itself is a cash in cash out basis you get a revenue report that shows up monthly or something that works that way I, I really I don't know that it all goes in monthly but what would that look like as well for the for to be able to balance those numbers and see that trend also and there keep in mind that it is um, there's always a lag uh, so we do have reports that are provided by our um, our actuary as mm -hmm. well as um, we have third-party administrators that provide us financial reporting in addition to what we do internally um, there is a lag between when the premiums are collected and the claims are actually paid out and and you could have people that right you know Under so. understood okay. um, but if that if that information is available and is added for even previous plan years then it informs us even better about monies over time and then where these trends do become evident that's visible to all both with respect to revenues that may fluctuate with employee participation and with respect to claims uh, on the expense side and that that I think uh, increases the transparency of the document yeah we can provide that I don't know how how useful it will be because of the fluctuation each year I mean because you have the actual premiums like we can give you the premiums collected each year and uh, I'll, I'll take I, I'll for starters I will take whatever we can get to begin to see that because I don't know that uh, knowing my own skills with numbers if it shows up as a annual amount I'll figure it out no we have yeah. it, no okay, we good. can provide it monthly yeah, I, I just I don't I mean it's there's not necessarily a direct correlation, which is why we're, we have the issue that we have right now. It comes down to your increase in your claims and whether your money coming in is enough to cover your recurring costs. Right, and it's illustrated by the yellow line here where it really was. It was calendar year 2021 that started to see this increase. Um, we pull the claims that you see every month directly from United's um, website, you know, uh, from their employer uh, dashboard, and it just shows the amount of claims that they booked. So those claims might have been incurred, um, you know, two months ago before they actually booked them. But that's really the best indicator that we have to look at just the raw data month over month. And it gets kind of back back to my initial question so if the desired proposal to the district last year had been approved 30 million dollars instead of roughly 10 mm -hmm. that 40 million would be 20 and that 60 million would still be 40 and and we actually do have that on a slide if you'd like to uh, well to I just that. I guess I'm just asking yeah. because fundamentally so say that say that we had done exactly what the district wanted last year there would still be a 20 million dollar projected increase again in the subsequent year which just based on 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 your numbers of 248 a month for 12 months if you were to fully fund what you have projected up here that's three thousand dollars a year per employee um that means that 20 million will be a it would essentially be costing employees an additional thousand dollars a year for health care if this trend continues in the district wish to perpetuate their initial proposal there would have been and we did we did project there was potentially going to be an additional increase because our district proposal uh, was still less than what the actuary was projecting and we were still uh, looking at what our past historical claims have been and that they had always fallen well below the national trends and it was only during COVID did they tip tick back up to being an, aligned with the national trends so we did take a wait and see for that one year to say are our claims going to go back down to where they used to be and they just maintained to be consistent there was a slight decline after COVID but it did not go back to pre-COVID levels 
And then that compounded by the decline in actual enrollment as well um, did have a significant impact on the plan. Uh, but the actual, and you'll see it when you see the enrollment, the claims per employee has actually increased. And so now, it, it, you know, as the, the further we go by not funding the plan, the bigger the burden is to absorb that increase because it just keeps compounding each year, which is what our, our concern was that, you know, yes, I thought the actuary was more conservative. Normally actuaries are overly conservative. So I said, okay, let's not go for the full amount that the actuary is asking for, 40 million, let's start with 30, and then we'll see where the actual claims fall, and then we'll make adjustments so that we're not taking more than what we actually needed. Uh, but at least we're taking a step in the right direction. We weren't able to agree on the 30, we were able to at least get to 10, so at least it was something. Uh, but now we're, we have a bigger hill to climb because we have to absorb that increase um, that shortfall in 2024, as well as the potential shortfall in 2025. Is the decrease, is the shortfall gonna be $59 million? You know, that is still a projection at the end of the day, but the actuary was right in 23. He projected it was gonna be a $29 million shortfall, and it was 29 million. I have a question. Um did the COVID claims decrease in April 2023 offset uh, the cost in any way, the escalating costs? And what do you do with that money? Do you have a number on that amount? And what do you do? Does it roll over for costs for the following year? No, so the, we did have a slight decrease uh, in claims in 2022, I believe. Uh, but it was, all of that stays, whatever, if you want to call it, if there were any savings, it would have stayed in the plan, but the amount of revenue that we had in the plan wasn't sufficient to even cover the claims that year. But it is a completely separate fund. Every savings prior to when we started having the shortfall stayed in the plan, which is part of the reason why we have, if you look at that blue line, that ending fund balance, you see it was well above where we needed to be. There's a state required uh, uh, minimum requirement that we have to have 60 days of claims just sitting in that fund for reserve. And so that blue line, um, the green line shows where that minimum of the 60 days is, the blue line shows where we actually were. So we kept all of that money in the plan, and then, but now you see how quickly it's going away because we're using what money was saved now because we're, we're not collecting enough money to cover the cost. Is there an amount? Is that, there like a number on that savings? I'm, like, you know, you, you say that in, in April there was a decrease in claims. So is there a specific number that rolled, that stays in that fund? Like, no, did you there, save a million and it stayed in the fund to cover costs? It's not necessarily a decrease. Actually, yeah. the claims overall increased. So it's not, there was no true savings. If you look at the, the claims, it's, it's compared to what we've been pulling in, the claims have exceeded that. So there there really isn't a, a savings, even though COVID maybe went down, it, it, that didn't that didn't help us. Right, I mean, COVID that. went, I don't like to say away, COVID, the cost of COVID treatment went down, but it was replaced with medical inflation and specialty drugs and, and things like that that are impacting the cost. And a lot of the COVID related costs were tied together with, with actual other illnesses or other medical expenses. You know, for example, because these, these claims, these were audited, so a lot of this information, even as a district, we're not eligible to, we're not allowed to see a lot of the information for HIPAA requirements, but it, it did have to be audited as part of, as part of um, our annual audit. So we did have to provide the auditors all the COVID-related claims. And in some cases, if somebody came in and, and was for a pregnancy, and also had COVID at the same time, it was coded as COVID because the person had COVID, but the person was gonna have the baby regardless of whether they had COVID or not, but it qualified as a COVID claim, if that helps too. So, so some of those COVID related costs were not truly related strictly to COVID. Mm -hmm. 
And so that's why we didn't see a corresponding, okay, COVID went away now, so now we don't have all of these costs related to COVID because a lot of those were costs that were already going to be incurred. And there was just a supplement, you know, slightly supplemental cost because I'm sure they received additional care, maybe were in an isolated room because they had COVID, so there were probably additional costs on top of going into the hospital for having a baby. Um, but the majority of the cost was probably going in there and having the baby. Mm -hmm. Right, like if a mother had AIDS it, who was pregnant, right. it'd be the same, same thing. thing. Yeah. Same thing, mm -hmm. same thing, same thing. So is some of this behavior or is it more economical? Because what I'm saying is that we have people that are going to the emergency room when they should be going to, uh, you know, their providers. Right. Because I, 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 maybe there's an educational component to this, too, that we, we need to consider. Is I, know, I know money goes up and we got to do something to follow that money. But maybe there's an educational component to this, so we need to better train our, 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 our employees how to use their health care. Well, that comes down to the different co-pays and why mm -hmm. there is a higher co-pay when you go to the emergency room. So those are the options that we've looked at in the past. And so there is a higher co-pay when you go to the emergency room versus going to urgent care or your primary physician. Now you would think that would be the teaching mode right there. Yes, I know. But I still think we have people that are, I don't want to use, how do I, I don't, without phrasing this wrong, I'm going to have to just say it, that are misusing the, the, the program that there could be a better way, a more economical way for them and for us as a system that we could, that they, they could uh, use their health care plan. And I, that is one of the options where actually, that Ms. Bolton is actually going to uh, look into, and it would be a, a voluntary, a potentially voluntary program for employees, if you would want to speak to that. Sure, it's so premature, so. And that's why we, yeah. I find it a, a promising concept, though, that um, looks at, um, Clinics, primary care clinics, because we're losing primary care doctors from the network. And all insurance carriers and doctors are kind of parting ways philosophically. Um, and so these would be primary care clinics that would be something that we would, we would pay for um, with a flat fee. And they would be um, something, it, hopefully they would steer employees away from the emergency room and even the urgent care to, the, to a medical home there, there would be maybe four of them around uh, the county. It would steer them into a medical home with a primary care doctor that helps negotiate, not negotiate, but steer their care if they need a, a specialist to a center of excellence or um, rather, the, rather than the emergency room, they would be available even you know, in the middle of the night if a child has an ear infection and they would call um, you know, this concept, these, these facilities, and they may steer away from the ER and say, we can, you know, we can call you in a, an antibiotic. So we're just kind of exploring that um, concept. It's very premature. We're also looking at um, HSS. Do you want to talk about the, the copay on that? Um, and so the copay would be, the, the, the concept that's been proposed to us would be at no copay um, for employees. So it would clinics. be an incentive for them to go, you know, not go to the emergency room mm -hmm. for something that they could maybe handle somewhere else with no out-of-pocket expenses. So that is something that she's looking into. Yeah. And we would want it to be a voluntary option for employees, not something that would be mandated. How, how is the, the cost for emergency room, um, you know, expenditures relative to previous years? Because I know we did, like, a massive change some number of years ago where it went from a flat rate to a percentage up to your max out of pocket so like have the emergency rooms still been one of the main problematic areas in spite of that change emergency rooms are always problematic um we can get you that data as to how we compare to the norm but of course we did do the steerage with the 75 dollars urgent care copay as as you know opposed to the higher emergency room copay and then we increased it even further a few years ago so um Leanne, do you have any of that in your mind? No, we can just. I, I want to make sure that we okay. provide right. you because we get that. We can get that breakout. Yeah, from, we, we have from it. United Healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd rather just yeah provide you the actual numbers. Okay. Yeah. On the uh, on the uh, on the RX, I'm back on the spreadsheet if it helps. Um, on the prescription drug rebates um, for this year so far, the seven point seven seven point seven six million dollars. Um, 
Is there a number of months that that is tied to? We receive those quarterly, but there is a lag. Um, so some of the revenue that, that's stated for this year already is, a, is holdover from the previous year? Yes. Correct. Yes. Okay. Yes. I, it Correct. still helps me develop a way to, to analyze mm -hmm. and come up with. But that would then presumably, if that's, th so then in, like in a previous year, each one of those uh, red numbers presumes to cover roughly three months. So we receive them quarterly. Um, sometimes the rebate lag, though, is longer than three months. So it may represent, um, you know, drugs that were prescribed six months prior. We, you know, it's, but we receive them quarterly. So it's fair to say that that revenue we can look at on an annual basis. Okay. And the fact that it's going up is not necessarily good news. I mean, it's helpful, of course. But it means that we're prescribing a lot of prescription drugs. Um, these specialty drugs are driving a lot of costs in our trend. So it is good that we're getting the rebates, but it's also an indicator that the cost of prescription drugs is, is continuing to go up. Uh, one more question. The, the number at the bottom of the chart, line 27, that says total average for the first two months, yep. um, is there a reason that that number or that that calculation does not uh, contemplate a portion of the rebates that would apply to those two months, given that we, we see a trend, we see we can figure out over any, any four runs of red numbers what it was for 12 months on average. Is there any reason that that number does not contemplate the inclusion of those rebates to give a, a, a truer net uh, average for each of those two months? So if you just kind of look one line above that, you can see that um, the net of, of uh, average monthly claims, net of rebates. But I just do caution you in February because we're factoring in that $7.7 .7 million revenue with only two months of claims. Right. So well, it's, and that's, yeah. again, that's another numerical inaccuracy that for somebody like me creates angst. Well, and each month <laughs> you'll see that I fluctuate. It's just kind of a a real moment in time, and we do the total average net of the rebates, just so you can kind of look at the trend itself. But the, I guess yeah. my thought is this, if, if the $7.757 million is essentially then three months, if that number were divided by three, and then that number itself, that resulting number was taken off of the 20.1 million at the bottom, we'd probably have a something closer to an actual net cost. Well, the way that I honestly look at it is I don't, I look at the rebates completely separate. I look at the rebates as a revenue number because those prescription rebates are not guaranteed. And in order for us to truly see what the trend and the increase is, I always look at the claims uh, gross, not including the rebates. And that's the way that we do our analysis and that's the way that, that we project. And then I, I look at the rebates completely separate as a revenue number uh, because it is very difficult to offset them uh, because it's, it's a timing difference. We don't know really when the, which claim the rebates are related to. Um, and so I, I look at it completely separate. So, I mean, that's why we do break it out um, because I think it's important to look at the actual claims um, and look at the increase in the claims, not including the rebates. And look at the rebates separate because the, the rebates have increased I mean, exponentially over the past several years. And, and, mm -hmm. and we've been, we're, we're trying to work with United Healthcare to, to please explain to us why these rebates are going up so much. Because, like I said, there's, there's not a guarantee that they're going to continue. Um, and it's because we are using a brand name drug. Um, and, and, like, Ms. Bolton said, you know, would we have more savings if we looked at other options as to other drug options other than what we're, uh, what we're doing? Would we be able to actually save more receiving less in rebates but actually spending less on, on the actual cost of the prescriptions? So those are options we're looking at as well and questions we're going back to United Healthcare with. But I agree with you. It makes it difficult when you're yeah. when you're doing the comparison, especially since it's a cash account, and right. and so literally, as I think in terms of it, every dollar in versus every dollar out gives us really what is the net cost uh, month over month. And uh, and since we're not looking at at revenues as well, I mean we don't see that whole picture. 
But if we're going to see what the cost is per month for total claims, it just seems prudent to include as much close data um, on the revenue side that applies in each and every number rather than, or each and every total, rather than pulling out that one thing uh, specifically. At least for me, it does. Yeah, we can definitely provide the, the revenue numbers. That, yeah. That would be great. yeah, yeah, not a problem. And then just an, another question on the, the prescriptions. Um, on like the, the spreadsheet we have, there's like another block underneath this that shows like the annual monthlies for the past corresponding years up here. What's the four or $500,000 difference between the average monthly claims, less rebates on each of these completed calendar years, and then the total monthly claims that are reported in the boxes in the, the separate grid below it on the spreadsheet that we have access to. So the total is is a net of rebates, and it just attempts to show you the actual trend. Okay. So I, I guess, for instance, for, for 2023, we have up there that the the average monthly claims less to rebates is 17.7 million. And then in, it's not visible up there, but on the spreadsheet, if you go down to the total columns for each year, it says the average monthly claims are 18.1 million for 2023. So we, we just want to identify what that describes. That's just because estimates, or but that's a completed year. So shouldn't the average monthly minus RX rebates equal um, the average monthly? So the average monthly um, is reference there on that it's that highlighted 18.1 it may be um it may be rounded i'll i'll cross well, I, you're, reference you're looking at the spreadsheet we yeah. that it's, it's, the, it's one that the one we i send. sent the monthly claims yeah. that i sent and it has this but it's low. got a yeah, it it's got a the, subtotal column for the annuals that have completed it underneath has it the percentage increase year over year for the total claims net of rebates um, well, yeah, let me, let me pull it yeah. up. And the reason why it's not on this slide is because it doesn't fit. But I Understood. can... I know, because there's, there's so Understood. much information. I know, we but just I wanted, can... Uh, that was a question we had where if, if that number, again, the 17.7 is like the true final 23 annual monthly cost for that year, and then the annual monthly cost reported for 23 in the box, the boxes below it that aren't visible here is 18.1. We're just curious what that gap is. Right. Well, so the 18.1, again, is really just an attempt to show just medical trend. Just scroll up there. There it is. It's that Oh, highlighted. and the, actually the enrollment is on that yeah, sheet. That. Yeah, so because I was like, I know that we had that on. Yeah, <laughs> we're something. good on enrollment. Thank okay. you. Okay, all right. So there, I mean, that's a, you know, perfect example to, to show, you know, the, the monthly cost per employee because we went from 20,918 enrollment in 2020, average cost per, monthly cost per employee, $831. To 2024 average cost of a thousand, so it's showing that. Are, are you able to I, I isolate where in the employee workforces those numbers are, you know, are declining more in the participation rate? We have to or be. No? We do have to. We receive reports at a very high level uh -huh. uh, because there are so many restrictions on uh, HIPAA uh, requirements. Um, so we do receive them in. Uh, you can give more details, but we, we monitor the diabetes program. Mm -hmm. We receive a report that shows the high dollar claims um, that we have in the district, and if you can. Yeah, I mean, our cost drivers are neoplasms, of course. You know, the cancer diagnoses, the musculoskeletal, actually. Um, diabetes is a cost driver. We don't necessarily isolate them. Um, you know, by workforce, our average age is a little bit older than the typical American employee, you know, so I as we, we get older, we get more expensive. I think we have to be very careful with that because sure. we wouldn't want anybody to think that we are in any way discriminating. A, and and, I, and I would so be the first person to say absolutely yes. not. You know, right. it's just it's so. just a curious question. 
uh, to try to, to isolate and understand a little bit more. It's not, a, it's not something that anybody does anything about. Um, um, absolutely protecting people's rights to uh, uh, protect their, inform their personal information on all of this is, is paramount. So. Do we ever shop insurance providers? Well, we are self-insured. We use United Healthcare to administer our plan. Uh, we go through an RFP process. Uh, so the last time we went for an RFP was at one. Is, it was three years ago. Um, yeah, I believe it was. It was before I joined. It was like 2021 for plan year 2022. And it's a five it's years with a five-year option to renew. Okay. That's got to be and coming so up we soon. Pay, right. it, it, Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I believe it was three years ago um, that we went. And so they, we pay them an administrative fee. We pay United Healthcare an administrative fee. Otherwise, we're paying the actual claim costs. There is no additional cost that we pay to United Healthcare other than the administrative fee, which is a per head amount that we pay. Mm -hmm. Yep, we pay them. And then that's yep. why we were able, since we were well below the national trends, all of those savings that we received each year stayed in the plan. And one of the reasons why we didn't have to increase our premiums. If we were fully insured, we would still continue to pay the premium. Mm -hmm. They'd have premium increases every single year. And we would, not, we would not get any money back. You know, if the insurance provider was making money off of us, great. They would keep that money. Mm -hmm. It would not be coming back to the district. And so it was one of the reasons why we went self-insured. Because, uh, let me see, that was, I've been with the district 17 years. Uh, so we went self-insured 17 years ago. And um, it was, to be honest, it was a, a scary switch because it was us being responsible for the claims. We had to, if, we ha if our premium was not correct, we were the ones who had to absorb it. We were the ones that if we had big increases like we're seeing now, we had to absorb them. Uh, we didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but we were fortunate to be able to see that you know, we are, our, and our insurance provider, the reason why we went self-insured was because the percentage increases that we were having each year, you know, it was 10% increases in health premiums and there's nothing you could do. You know, that's, and you can look at other providers and other entities that are fully insured. That's what their increases are. And you can't tell them no at that point. You are held hostage. And so that's the decision we made to, to, uh, to be self-insured. So we've been able to keep all of the savings that we were able to um, uh, to have during the years within the plan and let the employees realize the impact of having claims lower than what the national trends were. But now we're at the point where we need to increase. And if we were fully insured, they'd be taking some profit along with just, you know, the trend increase as well. So the numbers would be worse. So I guess kind of to put a, a punctuation, punctuation mark on some of the, the earlier questions I had with the potential annual projected increases at this point and the cost to employees in the district is that if, if it's foreseeable that this conversation, even if satisfied to what the district were asking, which I'm not saying we're in any way drifting in that direction, just to be clear, um, it would be an annual conversation, possibly in perpetuity, which it would be unsustainable for any group of employees, certainly the lower income ones to the, to the teachers who I consider medium income in the spectrum of, of positions in the district to have to potentially fork in another thousand dollars a year in premiums. So if there are alternative ideas to discuss, that has to be explored. I assume both sides agree versus an annual discussion about a thousand dollar increase in premiums. Our goal is to try to get back to where we used to be, you know, but at this point we have to catch up and that's part of our problem is we're playing catch up at this point. And we were using the ESSER funds to subsidize that shortfall and um, unfortunately those claims did not go back to the pre-COVID levels that they were before. And then the cost per employee just went up. It's just, it's costing, it's costing more money. And to understand, you know, just, you know, to put it on the table as well, um, we have one bucket of money. When we're looking at the funding we receive from the state, we don't have the option like 
uh, Palm Beach County to set our millage rate. Our millage rate is set by uh, the state legislature. And that's why you have to, when you're looking, you have to really compare us to the other districts versus compare us to um, Palm Beach County. Um, but we are very limited on our funding. And so whatever funding we do have available, um, that's what's also available for raises. So whatever money the district um, contributes related to health benefits is money that comes off the table for raises. Um, so we have to also keep that um, into consideration as well. Uh, because when you have it as a raise and then you have an increased premium, um, that does help that, you know, it does help your FRS rates, you know, that goes into your pension. It is a consideration. Is there a conversation to be had with United Healthcare relative to the, the national phenomena of COVID related inflation not coming down because companies are choosing? not to respect the reality of the market, which is inflation has cooled while trying to reap higher, higher profits because it, it just seems bizarre. And this is something, again, that's not exclusive to our conversation in healthcare that costs went up because there was this global disaster that clearly impacted everything. And those impacts have been completely negated by the emergence from COVID, but the costs have, have not decreased a dime. They haven't gone down any, so I, I don't know if our ability to leverage our size with United Healthcare, maybe they don't care because they are massive, even though we're the biggest employer in the county, but it just, it seems to be, you know, I subscribe to that theory that there are companies that are exploiting the distance from COVID to continue to inflate their profits at the expense of inflating regular working people's income, so. I get that, but we negotiate with United Healthcare. I can't solve the national issue, but we directly negotiate with them. But and, it, I'm sorry, you can answer. Yeah, I was going to say, and we also have, you know, other providers as well, and so that's why Ms. Uh, Bolton is, you know, not only working with United Healthcare, but with the other providers like the um, the concierge service that she was um, just speaking about. That that is not something that came to us through United Healthcare. Um, and that proposal did not come through to us um, from United Healthcare, and there are other organizations, other entities that have come to us as well. Um, so that's why we're trying to bring everybody to the table to say, what can we do, and what can you bring back to us to help us uh, to to reduce the cost of our program? Katie, did you have a question? What did you say to 48 per employee per how? What's the time frame? A month. There? Per month. So uh, I think part of our group challenge here also is HCA, which is Hospitals Corporation of America. They're pretty much becoming the monopoly of my hospitals in the country, not only Florida. They just recently took over Palms West, for example. Um, you know, they're, they're, their obligation is to their stockholders, you know, not, and then the hospital's obligation is to the patient. So right now they're trading at $330 a share and compare that to Disney at 120 or Google at 150, they're doing quite well. You know, so maybe a solution could be to uh, maybe negotiate with uh, HCA directly. There's HCA Florida, which is subsidiary of HCA Healthcare, which is part of Hospital Corp of America. So, you know, I know in the past, uh, for example, Palms West Hospital, if you went to the emergency room, is a $150 copay, but if you paid that day, it was 125 So maybe if we, we, we say, hey, we'll tell our 20,000 members to uh, try to focus them towards an HCA hospital, and maybe you give, charge them half the copay on an emergency room visit and discounts on other services, as opposed to going to their competitor. Well, uh, we do. Well, no, United Healthcare does negotiate on our behalf. They negotiate with the hospitals as well as all the doctors. So, for example, my dermatologist, uh, they could not come to an agreement with United Healthcare, and they're no longer on our plan uh, because United Healthcare wanted to pay less than what they were willing to accept. Uh, we had different hospitals that. We're no longer on our, on our plan because they couldn't come to an agreement on accepting what the negotiated rates were. Uh, so United Healthcare, I mean, that is what they do. Um, they, 
That's what they do on our behalf. And it makes a lot of employees unhappy. I'm sure it probably made some of you unhappy as well. Um, and it, it is a different rate. When you go and pay cash, because I'm you know, gonna continue to go to my dermatologist because I've been going to my dermatologist for, for 10 years. So now I, I pay cash. It's not honestly that much different than what I was paying out of, uh, you know, through insurance. But they don't have to deal with the insurance. So is there any legal uh, uh, thing that stops us from, on some level, forming a coalition and negotiating directly with the with the source? We would then be administering our own plan, right. and so then yeah. we would have to hire a whole staff and team, just like United Healthcare has, that would manage all of our claims. So we pay United Healthcare. I believe it's eight million dollars a year to manage our health. Well, not necessarily manage the claim, but uh, negotiate the costs. That's but all. That's, we would but be doing. that's who's managing that's the claim. But that's who's managing the claim. So if we're going to negotiate directly with the hospital, we would be the then, be the ones then collecting the invoices, checking the invoices, reimbursing the mm. hospital. So we're paying United Healthcare to do that on our behalf, and we pay them eight million dollars to have the teams in place in order to, you know, think of the volume of the number of employees we have. So we have 20, 19,000 employees. When you consider all of the dependents, I believe it's close to 40,000. Yeah, we have about 37,000 mm -hmm. with, with our dependents. Your, you know, your point is a good one, um, but some of the, the problems with, ne you know, direct negotiations is the hospitals would love that, right? Because it would leverage them against United with the largest employer. Uh, so we haven't, and we are looking at the primary care model, which kind of does what you're suggesting. Um, but we also want United to have that leverage in our community uh, to be able with their huge volume to negotiate those prices down as far as they can. It's kind of a delicate balance, but your when's, point's well taken. When's your obligation up with them? 2026? 26. 2026? 2026. Is that right? Maybe 27. We can go back and, and verify yeah. and look and see when it is. Can you send me the actuary report too? Sure. Yeah, we can provide that. December of 2026. So December? for plan year 2027. Okay. We have an option to renew, uh, but. No, she, um, Ms. Mendoza was asking for us to also send over a copy of the actuary Yes, report. we can do that. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And that's something that is updated to every month, you know, because that's something that fluctuates based on actual claims. Yes. And so it was actually last month was $62 million was the shortfall. This month is $59 million. So it is going to fluctuate based on actual claims. But we, I do expect it to be, you know, between 55 and $65 million throughout the year. Okay. If you could send us this too, because I'm just, we're going to have yeah, to. We'll send oh, you the did. Deck. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. Cause no, we I'm, didn't yet, but we will. Okay, we're gonna have to go back to the membership. So, of course. And like and, and like Ms. Bolton said, you know, this isn't a proposal. This is just saying, look, this is what the the need is in the plan because we've been keeping you up to date since uh, fiscal year 2022. Uh, you know, just the state of the plan, and you know, look at we are seeing an increase. Initially, we were wanted to wait and see to see what would happen related to COVID. Um, but we're not seeing the, the, the claims roll back. And that was why we did propose the increase the last year to do more of a stepped approach into the increase versus now playing catch up. Eric, do you have a question? Yeah, just uh, and, uh, Eric Stern, staff associate so president. Sorry, I was late today. Um, you know, I, since I've been up here, I, I'm on blood pressure and, and cholesterol medication too, so that's something <laughs> the district office. But anyway. But you're not supposed to, that is private information. Sorry. Please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Not the recording. I know, we'll have to strike it out. Um, it's more common than you think. As far as, <laughs> as, far as the claims go um, per month, you know, uh, um, I'm assuming that some of the biggest claims is probably medication, that drugs, and, and things that for many, many, many people are probably taking something. So my, my point is, is that, um, does the United Healthcare pay the same cost for all the pharmaceutical companies in our county? Like, if I went to a CVS or a Walgreens or a Publix, is it the same? If I'm on one particular medication, is it the same cost they pay out for all those pharmacies? Because it appears that we could pay different prices at all those pharmacies on our end, 
So I was just curious if it's the same cost, and if it isn't the same cost, how do we kind of you know make that continuous across the across our county? And then it goes back to the education point that Jim was making. How do we make our consumers, our employees, aware of that? First, I would mention that uh, we are one of our biggest savings that we had in our prescription drugs was when we negotiated just not we had to negotiate between Walgreens and CVS. Um, so as employees, we're only supposed to go to CVS. Um, versus Walgreens. You can go to any other pharmacy that you'd like, um, but that resulted in a savings of... It did. It was about uh, 1.5 or more. It was it was a substantial savings, and over time, it's... it's I, I don't want to say a number. Yeah, but that, but that was correct, one of the largest was, savings that we yeah. were able to achieve with the prescription drugs. So um, I guess what you're looking for, though, is there a way to educate or communicate with our employees um, it, to help save reduce some of these these costs, right? Absolutely, and just to further the example, like, you know, when I've been to CVS to pick a prescription, because you develop a relationship with the pharmacist or staff, they'll say, hey, you know, if you go to Walmart or you go to, and maybe use one of these little cards, you know, you can save out of your own pocket $150 per this prescription. So, but if we're kind of directed maybe to go to a CVS, mm -hmm. you know, they're kind of telling us to go somewhere else as well. Well, I would also say for just um, uh, different health procedures as well, we have um, something within United Healthcare, and I know I've received the calls before, that there, it's almost like a follow-up visit, and then also a health advocate that works on your behalf. And you can call up that health advocate and say, this is the procedure I need to have done, and they help you to locate you know, uh, you know, where you should go have that procedure done. Um, it will help you look at the pricing to see which pricing would be cheaper for you because even you know going to get an MRI it's a different price depending on where you go um, so you that is something we have within our United Healthcare plan and we can look at the communication of that to make sure employees are are aware of it um, like I said I know I've received after um, you know follow-up calls and we, we can get follow-ups on on um, that process and how it's been working Any other questions? Well, I thank you all for, for being here today. Um, you know, I, I, this isn't the greatest information to share. I recognize that. Uh, but I know uh, ahead of our next session, we will provide some of the additional data and information that you guys have requested. Um, and, and in our next session, I think we would have some recommendations on the districts and of, of what we feel the premium increases would look like. Um, so uh, I think. We have those dates scheduled. We were trying to get one in April uh, to, to move move along through this and not let it drag out for, for as long as it did last year. But um, if not, I know we have a, at least a couple in May. So, all right. So yeah, and, respectfully, and we will send this uh, presentation as well with yeah, all the other Perfect. Data. Yeah, the, the April dates just can't work for us okay. at this point. All right. Well, yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice day.